the attributions of your icons can change. Sure. Uh, in Rembrandt studies, this is a perfect example. We've seen it too recently in the Bosch exhibition. Um, no. Works from the Prado were, were, were not lent because of a deattribution or an attribution dispute. No. So, um, what I want to ask you in this regard is you, you, you both engage with outside teams. You also have your own curators, so your directors with your own team of experts. To what extent do they and you determine attribution in your institutions in relation to what goes on in the outside world? And by the outside world, I mean not just the academy, but also that scary word, the art market. Well, yeah, it's a good question, but I say that every every attribution is stands on itself. So it's it's difficult to say in general what would be uh, some some golden rule in, in attributing uh, works of art to certain masters or or vice versa. So we are very reluctant in 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 giving attributions because then somebody from the Rijksmuseum has said it is a this or that. So You mean uh, an, uh, from another collection or a private collection? Yeah, then? yeah. Uh, or, or private people who come in or send us pictures or whatever. I mean, it's happening all the time. I think the same with, with you. The Van Gogh Museum, for instance, did for a long time have the policy of not judging other Van Goghs except for their own, because they have Van Gogh uh, from all over the world coming, uh, people to their office with, with postcards or with the real works of art, whatever, and, and having a, a, a queue, whether if it's Van Gogh or not. I mean, it's, and it's normally it's not about Van Gogh or painting, it's always about money. So, um, and these two go hand in hand more and more. And so the Van Gogh is not, uh, their policy is, is to say we're not going to judge on other Van Goghs because we're not doing it at all. Because there is this money side, and when there's money involved, there's also a legal side. Um, and sooner or later, you, you have dispute about whether if it's yes or no. So some of our curators are vetting in, uh, and it's, uh, for, for art fairs, mm -hmm. and when they do, and I did it myself in the past, uh, you have to sign up that, that uh, everything that is in the vetting for the, for, for the art fair will not be disclosed afterwards, because you can imagine that, that if there are attributions or not attributions to certain works, that these works that has been brought to the art fair by a dealer and they, they represent a certain value, that if some experts say, well, it's not a Van Gogh or whatever it is or should be, uh, yeah, it's, it has no value at that point. So it's a very, it's a tricky situation. very sensitive. I, I, yeah. uh, I take your question slightly differently. I think you may mean uh, about our own collections. Ah, okay, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. That's all right. Okay. Uh, we, I think uh, times have changed in this regard. Uh, as I mentioned with my story about Saul and David, it's no longer one man, and honestly, in Rembrandt's stories, it was one man in his study on his own said, it is or it isn't. We now need so much specialized equipment to evaluate things that this is a team effort. So things have changed enormously in that regard. Um, uh, I also think that, I hate the word, but transparency is extremely important in all of this, so that if someone comes and questions uh, an attribution or has a reason to do that, you have to be open about that. We, we're art historians, we're scholars. I think we have a, a responsibility to know our field and to know what we're talking about. Uh, example is uh, the, self, the early self-portrait by Rembrandt, which hung for many, many years. Uh, beautiful early work in the Mars House as a Rembrandt. It was subjected to infrared um, reflectography. Turns out there's a very precise underdrawing under the painting, which means that, which is very uncharacteristic for Rembrandt. And there's a similar work in Nuremberg. The Nuremberg work is the original, ours is a copy. It's a very good copy, but we, 
in, we, we show it as a copy and we're completely open about that and have been for many years. So I think there, you know, the, the Rembrandt comes up often in this because he's a complicated artist, um, but in many ways he, our knowledge, our knowledge base has grown so exponentially. There are so many more factors to consider in these attributions. Uh, we know so much more about studio practice and materials that um, you know you really have to uh, reevaluate constantly, and, constantly. Changing, constantly changing, and it yeah. will keep yeah. changing as we so. develop new and new techniques and new materials. Yeah. To your point about um, externals, I think um, it's funny because, as you mentioned, I had an experience in Scotland, and I, I remember when I was a curator there, it was a normal mm -hmm. part of things that people would come in with works of art, and you would. It was sort of like the antiques roadshow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, to some extent, I, I, I think that as a public institution, it is your role to extend your expertise to people who come and ask for it. Um, but Vim is absolutely correct. It's become more complicated recently, especially with high value items. The policy that I maintain is that the curators who know a lot about the art that's presented to them may certainly form their opinion a titre personnel. So it's their opinion, it's their own, it's not the opinion of the museum, it's their own opinion. And we never give a value. I don't know. No, of course, no, 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 no. We didn't in Scotland either. So, so uh, attribution is important. We've talked a bit about, about how technology has changed the way we look at attribution. And that's a big change. In, in, Every day, I mean, you, you have new in, techniques. Infrared, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Infrared yeah. reflectology, pigment analysis. Yeah. So, is it a problem that connoisseurship, as a field of endeavor, is increasingly on the wane in art history departments across the world? Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Sure, I mean, so connoisseurship is, is, is of its key, I mean, to anything that we do. I mean, not only attributions, but also to, to well, to, to have works in a context. I mean, it's not is it, if it's whether of yes or no, a Rembrandt or Vermeer or whatever, but connoisseurship, it starts with connoisseurship. Of course. I mean, anything you We're do. We're going to agree wholeheartedly. Museum people will always say it's all about the object, stupid. You know, you need to know what you're yeah. looking at. You yeah. need to know how to look at it. You need to know how to place it into its material context. And I think, to be fair, you, you would be cheating your visitors if you didn't take it seriously. An anecdote, I, uh, when I was a graduate student in New York, I worked on an exhibition uh, that was entitled Rembrandt slash not Rembrandt. Sorry, we keep going back to Rembrandt, but he's the <laughs> prime example. And it resulted, there was a cancellation in their exhibition program and they needed to think of something quickly. So the uh, director at the time, who I think was here, Philippe de Montebello, decided, well, maybe we can do something with the Rembrandts and talk about what's by Rembrandt and not by Rembrandt. And so he asked the curator at the time, who sadly died recently, Walter Liedke, and their chief uh, conservator to work together on this. And it was like boys in a sandbox. They could not agree. It was a disaster. So de Montemello took a very a Solomonic decision. He said, right, you each write your own catalog. We're going to sell it as a box set. <laughs> and I had the privilege of doing most of the sort of tours, the, the guided tours around, and it was so interesting to watch people. A very small percentage said, oh, I thought this was a Rembrandt show and it's not and I'm leaving. I want my money back, very New York. But most of them were absolutely, it was like, scales fell from their eyes. They, they really were thirsty to understand how we look at pictures, how we evaluate, they want the stories. And, it's okay to talk about the gray area. And for me, this was an absolute formative experience. It was in 1995, and, and, and I think this also led to my, and I think you share this, is desire to open things out, not to keep it all secret and closeted. People really want to know it. So, you know, for you art historians who are still learning, do learn how to look. And sometimes you yeah. don't know. It's okay. I mean, even the Rembrandt Research Project, the most esteemed specialists on Rembrandt, I mean, the, uh, within 10 years, they, they, they attributed, again, paintings that were rejected in the past and vice versa, because of technique is changing, and the, and, and the whole way of, of, of looking at Rembrandt changes as well, and new Rembrandts, strangely enough, they pop up sometimes. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's changing, it's, it's not, black and white, well most of, it, most of them it's, it's easy, it's yes or no, but this category in between, it's difficult to say that. 
Well, the, and there's also increasing, you know, there's a, hu a huge amount of knowledge now about how the studio practice was, yeah, the use of materials, is, yeah. but also um, how the state of conservation can affect your opinion. Mm. This is a really quite recent phenomenon where you can say, you know, this may not look at first glance like it's by the master, but you know the top layer has been removed in a bad uh, conservation treatment in the past, or it's flat because it's not, it wasn't well relied. And when you take those other factors into account, you might come to a very different conclusion. Mm -hmm.